uh, welcome back to everybody. The school year has started, which means we got to get real and, you know, show up right. Um, and uh, happy fall. What a beautiful day in Maryland today. Um, and uh, we are we are opening the uh, Lead Poisoning Prevention Commission meeting for uh, September the 5th. I think I'm right, Wendy, the 5th, is that September right? September 5th, we are right. in September. 2024, the year that Fred Banks is gonna turn 30. Yes. Um, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna leave that be uh, for Dr. Banks um, to be so accomplished and be so young. Uh, very, very happy to be joining you um, here. And uh, we have a lot to talk about. We have Lead Poisoning Prevention Awareness Week uh, coming up next month. <laughs> I'm um, hoping that we'll make it an extraordinarily robust uh, outreach uh, in partnership with our really good property owners and contractors, state government agencies, and advocates. I'm pleased to report that we have two nominations going in from parents of lead poisoned children um, and one from a new community advocacy group. Um, so we've got interest uh, coming in in the commission. Um, and we're hopeful to work this year with all of the investments that are being made uh, to raise uh, the profile. I don't know if anybody saw the city of Baltimore did a did a piece with um, on their work with uh, WBAL uh, around a lead poison child and rental property. So I'd love the city to talk a little bit more about what they're seeing and facing on the rental property uh, piece. I know also this year, uh, I'm pleased to announce that uh, our own organization has received funding from the state to restore legal services uh, and tenant counseling um, that we will uh, restore. Thank you to Governor Moore and the legislature and MDE. Um, we're able to restore at least for one year those legal services. We're gonna have to all work uh, to figure out how we sustain that over time. Um, so at the top of this though, please note that we will be putting out or is out a link um, to hire an attorney uh, to get to work on these cases uh, more aggressively, which means we're also gonna have to get back to a better uh, early referral into tenant counseling and legal services from not only the city, but all of the counties. Um, if we could uh, ask um, that the members of the commission uh, say good morning uh, for the public uh, here. We'll start with uh, Adam Skolnick, starting with the A's. If you could just say, uh, if commissioners could just say who they are and where they're from, I would appreciate it. Adam, you're muted. I'm not yeah, sure if you're aware of that. Got it. Thank you. Adam Skolnick with the Maryland Multi-Housing Association, Commission member. Okay. Barbara Moore. Hi, I'm Barbara Moore, Pediatric Nurse Practitioner, Director of the Lead Poisoning Program at Mount Washington Pediatric Hospital. Fantastic. Benita Cooper. Good morning. I'm Benita Cooper with the Maryland Insurance Administration Commission. Fantastic. Who do we have next? Is it Fred on behalf of the MDE or is that Paul? Jacob's on. Jacob. Good morning. This is Jacob Benzakan with JVC Management. And, and Jacob, what part of the state are you from? What part of the state? Uh, Pikesville. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry? In Pikes, I'm in Baltimore City in Pikesville. Baltimore City. Okay. Got it. Mangela. Um, yeah. Mangela. Good morning. I'm Mangela Paul, nurse consultant from Office of Child Care, Maryland State Department of Education. Thank you. Paul? Oh, there we go. Good morning, Eastern Shore. Welcome, everybody. I represent the Maryland uh, chapter of American Academy of Pediatrics. Fantastic. Uh, and who else do we Paula. have? Paula Montgomery. Good morning, everyone. Maryland Department of the Environment led program. Great. And I don't see Cliff Mitchell, but uh, not yet. Susan's okay. on the phone. Susan, you want to introduce yourself? Okay. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Sue Kleinhammer, accredited risk assessor, commission member, Lead Tech Services. Okay. I think Great. that's everybody. 
and I'm Ruth Ann Norton uh, with the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. So if we could um, uh, pull up the minutes and the agenda, uh, if all have read the minutes of the last meeting um, from the commission, uh, if there are any comments or amendments. Hearing none, um, uh, all in favor to adopt the minutes. Aye. 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 Sorry, I should have gotten a motion. Aye. I'm sorry. Let me go back. I'm getting reminded. I should have gotten a motion. Can I get a motion to adopt the minutes? I'll make a motion to adopt the minutes. A second. As presented. Anybody second. second? Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Wendy, seeming that it's unanimous, unanimous, we've adopted the minutes. Um, if we could uh, get to uh, our business agenda, uh, Wendy, if you want to talk about the lead commission or report, please. Okay. So just as an FYI, um, it took a while, but we now have the lead poisoning prevention commission annual report that we are supposed to be um, sending to the governor's office yearly on a, a yearly basis so that is now on our website and you can find that on our website under um, annual reports so there's a link there you're able to get to it, it it'll show you previous reports as well um, but this is for last year's um, so i just wanted to make you guys aware of that um, i didn't want to like attach it in the attachment because there's just pages and pages and pages because it's basically all of our minutes that we have um, uh, combined into one and, and, and then plus like a summary of it. Um, also on August, I think it was around mid-August, I sent out for to the commissioners, I sent out an email asking um, you guys to vote. Uh, I'm sorry, asking you guys to uh, bring some nominees for the upcoming lead commission awards and recognitions that we're going to be doing in october so the deadline for you guys to to get your nominees in is going to be the 18th which is in a couple weeks and i've given you guys plenty of time um, i've only heard back from one person so i will resend the email just to um make sure it's up up top of your emails and and um if you guys can please commissioners please read the email make any recommendations and submit that by september 18th and then the votes once i get all the nominees i'll send out another one for you guys to vote and the votes will be due on september 24th and then october is when we'll be giving out the awards um the other or the last thing i wanted to mention is the commissioner member update so if i have yeah let me pull up the screen so you guys can take a look we have some announcements and some updates let me stop presenting this and pull up this one here um so just a few things uh, we're in 2024, so we still have two membership positions that have expired. I believe you guys have already submitted your application for um, to the governor's office, um, but that's for Barbara and Anna. Um, they're behind a little, a lot, so it, it's just taking a while to get these in. The upcoming ones for 2024 in September, um, which is this month, so at the end of the month. Um, the membership expirations for Ruth Ann, Paul Rogers. I think that was it, just the two. So Ruth Ann and Paul, you guys will need to go to the government, uh, the governor's website, and I can send you the link for that. You need to reapply if you want to continue um, serving, and they'll review and they'll send you a new letter um, with a new expiration date for your commission membership. Um, and then we still have vacant positions. We have two, yeah, no, three. We have three vacant positions. And we also have, let's see, Alexandra Nestat. She is um, a new commissioner for a parent of a lead poisoned child. Uh, so she has been appointed by the governor's office. Um, 
Wendy, she's actually on the at the meeting. She's online. Oh, wonderful. Oh, Let's welcome. Um, oh, she is. Okay. Awesome. Allie, uh, I did not notice that. Uh, welcome to the commission. Uh, would you like to say a few words? Well, that's fine. Thank you. Um, I don't really know what to say. My, my son uh, was, we found out he had lead poisoning almost two years ago now. Um, and it's something we're still dealing with. So I'm really glad that I get to be a part of this and that you guys are all um, trying to work to make sure that they, this hopefully doesn't happen to other people. Um, well, I really want to say thank you, uh, Allie. Let's make sure we make some time offline just to talk about maybe how um, we can use your voice to amplify the work of the commission and, and input. Do know we have another parent who is going to apply to one of the positions open, um, but it, um, it, that uh, also may be of interest in, you know, uh, that participation. We um, have a number of people now starting to have some new line interest here from advocacy. So uh, I know we've got a, we've got a, a candidate from Young, Gifted and Green who's doing a lot of great work on lead uh, as well. And so we'll, uh, what I would like to do, Wendy, is maybe the net, uh, in between do a orientation for new members and prospective members if we could do that between now and the next meeting and then at the next meeting um really encourage as many people to be in person so we can get to know each other as possible as far as the orientation you mean like um as a meeting as a as a virtual meeting yeah as a virtual okay. meeting okay yeah okay. i mean or we can host it at ghhi for those who want to come and um, and those who want to be virtual, that's fine, but look forward to that. Okay. So, Allie, my apologies for overlooking that at the beginning. Well, um, um, so I did want to, I did want to mention though, Allie, have you sworn in yet or have you not sworn in yet? I have not yet. I, okay. um, cause it officially is my first day without being a full in childcare. And I didn't think okay. I could bring a two and a half year old with me. <laughs> right. Right. No, officially you'll start serving when you do swear in. So okay, it's, yes, it's I have time tomorrow. Yeah. It's not official. So whenever you swear in, that's kind of when it becomes official. And then the same thing, Nicole Hart has um, also been appointed a representative of the local government. So we did hear back from governor's office. Nicole, I don't believe you have, is she on? No, she can't make this meeting today. She had to email okay. about that. Okay, so she, as far as I know, she has not sworn in yet, and um, but they're asking her to to get that done by October. So hopefully, okay. um, at our next meeting, Nicole Hart will also be uh, a new commissioner. Okay, I'll follow up with Nicole as well. Um, and thank you, and thank you, Wendy, for all of this. But let's uh, let's get back to the agenda of the day, and really, if you could pull that up, yep. and thank you, and thank you to Mount Washington for. Uh, working so well on advocacy to get uh, work with us to get folks on. Um, okay. But we, uh, I want to just uh, reiterate uh, here, uh, now that we're back in here in September, we still have not heard from the two leaders of the legislature. Uh, so uh, I intend to send a letter both to uh, Secretary Edwards as well as the uh, Senate president and uh, the speaker of the house, they have an obligation to appoint active members uh, here to, um, and I think uh, if it is uh, all, I think on behalf of the commission, uh, I will be sending a letter asking them to pay serious attention uh, to this. I am meeting with Delegate Boyce on Friday night uh, Friday afternoon, and I will be asking her again. Um, she is on the, the in the house uh, regarding her interest in serving. Um, so let's. Uh, if there are other thoughts on the legislative side, the people uh, to do that. I want to uh, be able to pursue uh, that. Um, Brad, we have you up for uh, MDE compliance. Good morning. Good right. morning, Fred. Did you want to share your screen for it, or do you want me to do it? Uh, I can do that. It was, okay. No. Yeah. 
All right, so I'm talking about uh, compliance and enforcement with the LED program. Um, and for most of the information I have is for 2023, but I did want to start with uh, Title VI, Subtitle VIII of the Maryland Environmental Article that, uh, that sort of guides everything we do here in the LED program and basically um, the presumptions that we have to make that all pre-78 homes have lead paint in them and that uh, rental properties do exercise, rental property owners do exercise reasonable care and that compliant uh, rental owner owners uh, exercise reasonable care is also. Um, so um, these are sort of like uh, the, the guiding principles that they go into the decisions we make as we go into enforcement and uh, making sure that all rental property owners are in compliance, as well as uh, individuals that work in the field of uh, lead abatement. And so as of uh, a few days ago, we pulled the numbers of potential rental properties that are built before 1978 in the state of Maryland. We had an estimated total of uh, approximately 300,000 rental properties um, built prior to 1979. And I'll quickly go to the next slide, and you can see that of those uh, 300,000, approximately 125,000 as of yesterday were registered with the state of Maryland. So we still have a good bit uh, of uh, work to do as far as making sure that uh, the majority of rental owners are in compliance with the state of Maryland. Um, we are in the process of doing what we call uh, as that project, we work with the State Department of Assessment and Taxation to get a list of all the properties that we believe are rental properties, and we're sending out letters daily, uh, what we call advisory letters, letting property owners know that if you are renting this property, that you should uh, register with the state of Maryland. Uh, Adam? Yeah, registered are, I mean, where, where are lead freeze and limited lead freeze in terms of registration what's the definition of registration so it so there's uh several definitions so if a property is uh registered they can have a uh, full risk reduction certificate or they can uh, apply for or get a uh, lead free certificate and i'll go through certificates as we get to the end of the end of the um presentation but there's several kind of levels of registration but um so if a property does have a lead-free certificate, then um, they do not need to uh, register that property with the rental registry uh, unit. So I, I just want to, I'm sorry, because so limited lead freeze and lead freeze are not included in the 150 whatever thousand registered properties. Some, some limited lead freeze and lead freeze do opt in to registration, um, but the majority of them do not. So we do have some some property owners that do have lead freeze that opt in to the registration um uh to the rental registry system so but uh the majority of them do not register with a uh, rental registry all right I, I just want to make sure so i mean one of the stats we probably should be tracking is how many do you guys have as limited lead free or lead freeze because that number of in quotes unregistered properties is dramatically lower when you factor in those. I mean, because th those, those, those properties are no longer, or those units are no longer need, you know, need registration. Right, and they they would not come under that number as unregistered, they, they're in compliance, so we, we can remove them from that list. So yeah. like we're, we're going through uh, uh, sending out notices of violation now, we, we go through that list uh, daily to make sure that we pull those out. Um, Unfortunately, it, we kind of leave it to the property owner to notify us that they do have a lead free to pull us because the list is so big. And so sometimes we will send out a letter and the property owner will call us and say, hey, I have a limited lead free or I have a, a lead free certificate. And then we will pull them off the list. So um, it's sort of a, a moving target, if you will. Um, but we do our best to make sure we clean that list before we start sending out uh, violation notices. Um, I think somebody in the conference room may have raised a hand. Paula was probably trying to help me answer this question. Um, Paula, did you have something or, or did I did I do okay? Well, no, no, you yeah, no, oh, 
Dr. Banks, no, it's fine. Uh, I just, you clarified it in the end, you know, registration and certification, you know, are, you know, apples and oranges. We do make sure that they have a risk reduction certificate when they submit a registration, they have to disclose of that by penalties of perjury. And, and just to um, reiterate, some of the properties that initially register, you know, in 2020 or 2021, 20, they may be registered and pay the fees in 2021, but then they can opt out the same year and not have to pay in 2022 if they become lead free. So it, it's, it's, it's very fluid and it's not, you know, this stagnant process for registration. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, uh, next slide is a map where we have sent out what we like to call administrative penalties, and these are notice of violations. So for last year, uh, we sent out over 11,015 uh, uh, notice of violations. Um, as you can see, there's uh, sort of a pattern of where they are. Um, I can tell you that we hired a new uh, inspector in Western Maryland in May of this year. So we expect those numbers in Western Maryland to, to go up. We really didn't have a presence in Western Maryland, a constant presence in Western Maryland um, prior to that. But we expect some of those numbers to go up with the age of the houses, the homes in uh, Western Maryland, some of the issues we have out there. But um, we are working to make sure that uh, people are in compliance. And so we, we expect it probably were i think about fourteen thousand in 2024 so those are currently going out now so those will go up for a while but we, in our hopes to do some more outreach to get those numbers down and to uh express to the public how important it is to register those properties so uh the next slide is what we like to call compliance inspection so uh unfortunately if we have a notice of violations that go out and we don't get responses. We forward these uh, referrals to our inspectors. They go out and do compliance inspections or uh, site visits. And this is sort of a map of what those look like across the state of Maryland. Um, as you can see last year, we did 2,600 compliance inspections resulting into, into a, a significant amount of penalties. Um, but once again, we're hoping to do some outreach to get those numbers down and make sure that uh, property owners stay in compliance with our office. And the next slide is environmental investigations. So these are referrals that we get from our uh, lead health and surveillance unit for poison children. And we did approximately 600 uh, environmental investigations last year. Um, that number may double this year, uh, considering with the 3.5s uh, threshold, we just start doing environmental investigations for the 3.5s to uh, 4.9s in January of this year. So we expect that number is going to probably double this year. So we, we are trying to save our inspectors from, from uh, wearing themselves out, but we really are, have a multi-tiered system to make sure that we don't overburden them with uh, getting out, but we do have to, to get out to evaluate these homes and, and make sure that they're safe. So. Uh, this is uh, another chart next with the uh, environmental investigations by county, as you can see. Um, so we didn't uh, we didn't do uh, as many environmental investigations in some of the southern counties. Um, we had some changes in inspectors there, so we do have an inspector that's designated to the eastern shore and to southern Maryland now. So we expect those numbers to go up this year as well. Um, um, but uh, we are making some some uh, footholds into some of the southern counties in Maryland. Any questions about investigations, inspections, penalties, um, Mr. Rogers? Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Frederick. I think it was an excellent presentation of the data. The question I have is: a pediatrician sitting in his office, can he or she access that? Um, catalog or database you have of homes so he will know if that or she will know if that patient in front of him or her uh, has come from a house that is 
at risk for lead poisoning? So, uh, so I do believe as a part of the questionnaire that you guys uh, issue to the, the patients when they get tested for lead, I did see that you asked for the, the age of the home. I will, I can send you a link to our uh, LRCA database where you can see the, the, uh, oh, and uh, our division chief, Kevin Stanley, just put that in the link. Uh, you can go and see whether a, a property has a lead certificate or if it's in compliance. And so that, if you go to that site, you just create a login and, and even the property owners, yourself, anybody from the public is, is uh, public face. And you can go see the status of the home that you're either getting ready to move into or uh, if you're transferring a child to or that you currently live in. So um, I hope that, that answers the question. That sounds really good. I look forward to seeing that link. OK. All right. It's in the chat, by the way, if anybody wants to pull that, uh, uh, Mr. Stanley just put that in the chat for you guys. All right, a couple more slides. I'll get through these pretty quick. Uh, one of the other things we do is to make sure that the uh, people that work in the field of lead abatement are accredited. So our staff and accreditation oversight oversees approximately 1,800 uh, people uh, annually that are uh, either contractors, uh, courses that are taught to uh, people that are uh, in the field of lead abatement and individuals and inspectors. Uh, abatement workers and uh, other workers in the field of lead abatement. <clears throat> As a part of that, uh, we uh, monitor uh, or we process uh, almost 2,000 applications in 2023, uh, issued about 1,900 uh, cards. Uh, about half of those were initial cards, another half was uh, refresher cards. So these, are, these are two year renewals for these uh, trainings. And this is just uh, a little more data on the types of uh, um, career paths that we, we see or we oversee. And these are abatement workers, uh, inspector technicians, maintenance and repair supervisors, project designers, removal and demolition supervisors, risk assessors, structural steel supervisors, structural steel workers, and visual inspectors. And then finally, uh, the certificates uh, going back to uh, Adam's point. Um, so we processed or uh, inspectors across the state of Maryland um, processed uh, over 30,000 certificates in 2023. Those also go through the LRCA system. So we get a chance to monitor them and they're at different levels. So the lead freeze are uh, the highest level of higher standard as far as uh, properties not not affected by lead and then you have the limited lead free the full risk reduction is sort of the minimum standard and then we have mod, uh, modified risk reduction lead safe you don't see too many of those anymore those were connected to uh qualified offers which i think were done away with uh maybe 2015 i'm guessing um but we do uh the public is able to go on to our website and see these certificates, see if they're valid. And if they, if we identify that either inspector has not filed the process or that uh, a certificate is in question, we'll reach out to the property owners and let them know that they have an invalid uh, certificate. I want to pose a question here to the commission, right? Which is yep, in yep. many states, there is a definition of lead safe. Um, and not having a definition of lead safe from a public standpoint, from a parent going to rent a house, from a buyer standpoint, I'm not even, I'm not, it, you know, I'll let Adam and Jacob weigh in on the property owner side, but from a consumer standpoint, right? Lead safe feels like an imprimatur that if done right, that would give comfort to people in their, uh, in the marketplace, right? Saying risk reduction, without it being associated with safe, right? And without the state weighing in, health, housing, and environment weighing in to say there's a level of safety here, right? I think we are really missing something um, <clears throat> that in le even less sophisticated states on the work that we do on lead, right? Maryland's seen as a gold standard. You know that from our time together up in Rhode Island, right? The reality is 
Um, there was something very good about what the legislature contemplated on lead safe originally that got thrown out with the constitutionality of the qualified offer by the courts. Um, I'd like to hear from the commission about thoughts about this and whether or not we think establishing a standard of lead safe um, would be beneficial. And um, if we could take a pause to do that, I'm happy to hear from the state as well. Um, but I think this is something that I've, I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, when we talk to parents, when we talk to families, when we talk to people in general, having something that feels more clear based in uh, science and evidence, um, I think would be helpful uh, because we have the experience of a kid, you know, who got a 97 lead level this year, don't forget, and all of the problematic that went from a kid who wasn't poisoned to a 21 to a 97 and the chaos and damage that occurs on that. Um, you know, having people really have something that tell, that puts that there. So do, does anybody have any thought on that? I know it's something that GHHI is thinking about. I'd love to hear from others. I can only see the top of Adam's head, so I think he's there. But um, your face is much better than the top of your head there. What can I say, bud? Yeah, I, I will, I, well, let me just, I mean, I think in very, I, I agree with you conceptually. I mean, invariably having federal and state laws jibe feels like it would be easier for everybody. Okay. I mean, you know, and, and we've had this dialogue multiple times and sometimes the department has been a little apprehensive because their impression is that the, you know, that the state is doing is being tighter than the feds, but and I understand that and I appreciate that concern. But when it's all said and done, whether you're the, you know, and Sue can jump in, I mean, whether you're training people, whether you're actually doing the inspections, whether you're a property owner, and and, and again, we've we've beaten this dead horse a million times. You know, Maryland's law really hyper focuses on rental properties, and we really need to be focusing on every kind of property. I mean, you know, when it's all said and done, you know, no one is suggesting rental property owners. I mean, they need to be in compliance and need to be part of this fixing this problem. And I think for the most part, I mean, the folks that I represent, who are the people that own and manage apartment communities, have done an amazing job over the course of time. It's kind of the smaller mom and pop folks that are more problematic. Um, but I, again, tying everything together from a standards perspective would make life a lot easier for property owners, for the public to understand, for inspectors, for trainers, et cetera. Uh, could I pipe in there? I can't raise my hand. I'm just on the phone, but this is Susan. Adam, I think you're, I think you're right on the money. I mean, many more calls are coming from owner occupants with children with slightly elevated blood blood levels. Um, and one of the problems that I have as a risk assessor is the Maryland Department of the Environment has certain protocols for how a risk assessment must be done, regardless of whether or not there's an elevated blood blood level child or not. Those protocols are so cost prohibitive that the general public, I mean, they're just, they're not going to be able to afford them. And then what happens? I mean, if the risk assessor is actually truly, um, you know, on top of it, um, they can't they can't perform any kind of a service unless it meets those kind of requirements. Um, and my other thought is, God forbid, if MDE follows EPA and if EPA lowers the standard for lead and dust to any detectable limit, because it's not going to happen in rental properties, it's not going to happen in basements, it's not going to, it's just not feasible. So I, I mean, it's just in the real world, you it just it's difficult enough now uh, to meet the standards uh, for floors, especially in unfinished basements. Somebody in the conference room has their hand raised and then Cliff Mitchell, Dr. Mitchell, welcome. Um, and then Dr. Mitchell has his hand raised. So who raised in the conference room? Was it Paula? Thank you, Wendy. This is Paula. Yep. Um, I, I'm a little confused by this conversation. I feel like it's going in a bunch of different directions. Um, 
I can say that lead safe is defined in our law. Um, so, uh, I mean, it, lead safe can mean a number of things. It can mean a unit that's certified as lead free. It can mean a unit, uh, a unit that's built after 1978, or it can mean a unit that is um, met the risk reduction standard. Well, so that's that, 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 no, uh, that's not that's yeah that's not correct. That's that not correct one. at all. Yeah, um, not at all because I'm looking that, at the law right be, now. Yeah, that, right. Well, that the law. Well, yeah, that's not right. Yeah. That's not, I okay. don't think that it would be a legal interpretation of what you're looking at, Paula. So what I'm going to suggest here, and it I also- mean, I just, I'm sorry, I'm going to fit, let me just finish. It's under 6-8- under the definitions 801, okay, lead safe, and it defines what lead safe is. And I just, lead safe housing, okay, means a rental dwelling unit that's certified as lead free, was, was constructed after 1978 or is deemed to be lead safe by the department in accordance with the criteria established with legislation. And that basically means that it meets the risk reduction standard. But, but that the, doesn't, it, what, hang on, hang on a minute. It, you, what it says there, in, and, and I'm gonna have a suggestion on how we do this, but what it says there is it's how the department deems it, but there is no real statement by the department and it's, it's extraordinarily subjective rather than, right, than a very clear definition, not tied to qualified offer, not tied to the sub subjectiveness of the department. What I am suggesting is there needs to be a very clear legislative definition of lead safe. That's what I'm, that was what I was proposing. What I want to do is take comment from Susan and Cliff. And then what I want to do is propose that we have a work group to work through this and that we include um, some outside experts on this, including uh, uh, folks who are uh, experts in legislative law on this, but uh, Susan and then Cliff. Thank you. And and Paula, maybe I maybe I, I butted in there and I shouldn't have, but the last time I checked, lead safe also meant that it couldn't just be risk reduction. It had to be risk reduction within 15 days of a child with an elevated blood blood level moving into that unit. Is that still part of the definition of lead safe? No, I mean look, I'm not trying to be oppositional here, but it's no. it, yeah, no, under, nor the, I. under the nor definition is very clear what lead safe means and it does include provisions under 6-815 which have absolutely nothing to do with the poison child so i, I mean i'm happy to get i don't i don't know if chris corazine is on this call or not but if we're going to do interpretations of our law we probably need you know our ags um involved um as yeah no well. doubt no doubt. And what I'm suggesting is we'll put yeah. together a responsible panel to look at this, but it can't just be internal. Um, we have to take a real look at it from a consumer standpoint, from a safety standpoint. We ought to look at Adam's point of where, where we want to have alignment with the feds, right? Um, but also honoring the fact that Maryland has a stronger standard to want to protect its citizens at a higher level. So to uh, Jacob, this you'll be the last question on this and then we'll move uh, to this and we'll work to get a panel set up to review this. But Cliff, you were first. Yeah, thanks. And and I apologize that I can't be there and I'm <laughs> hopping in and hopping out of there. Hold on, Jacob, can you go on mute you on uh, until, you until you speak, please? 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 Okay, go ahead, Cliff. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, and I'm sorry that I'm uh, I'm actually sort of hopping in uh, and then I'm gonna hop out again because I think we're, we're on travel and I'm likely not to be able to stay for the whole meeting, but I did want to, um, for this particular discussion, think about this from the family's point of view 
as we have had a number of cases where housing that has been either quote lead safe and called lead safe where people have been exposed because of uh, the the peculiarities of what lead safe means to the family i think this this goes hand in hand with a discussion uh, that we talked about a little while ago of where we are headed in the next five years with respect to lead poisoning prevention because of the the challenge that both adam and susan mentioned about multiple sources about the fact that we're looking now at water more than we used to it seems to me and this is just my personal opinion that there's a distinction between the processes that are used to identify and remove head in lead in a dwelling and calling the dwelling lead safe and the way a family perceives a lead safe versus lead free is usually that both of them are sort of synonymous and that there's no lead here and that it seems to me is a different thing than thinking about what are the processes that have been used in a particular dwelling regardless of who owns it to both identify sources of lead and to abate them and in some ways it feels as though we might be doing everybody a service by getting away from the term of lead safe and lead free to being more specific about where did we identify sources of lead and what did we do to either mitigate or remove those because that's a more specific description of what it is that the family is getting than simply calling it lead safe or lead free. So personally, from my point of view, it I would feel more comfortable given multiple sources of lead environmentally in helping a family understand what it is that we look for in a particular dwelling and how do we get rid of it. Noted. Uh, Jacob, there's, a, there's a comment that Barbara Moore made. Did you want me to read that, Ruthann? Uh, let's get to Jacob first. Okay. He was next. Jacob? Okay. Did we lose him? Yeah, I don't see him on anymore. He must have. Okay. Uh, 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 Barbara, uh, it says, if looking at the scriptures, consider terms of full risk versus modified risk, very confusing for families. I do think we just have to look at these things, right? As we, but my, I think, uh, Barbara, I, I don't know if you want to come online to this, but what the feedback that we're getting is this, um, what is actually safe uh, is very confusing to, to contractors, to owners that, that and to consumers. And it is at least something that we should look at in terms of that. Uh, and I think it would be uh, quite important to, to spend some time and maybe have uh, something concrete to discuss at the next meeting um, without trying to throw things into chaos, but to have, I mean, good law, good practice, good uh, when we're trying to eliminate something that's poisoning uh, the public, poisoning uh, young children, pregnant women, I think a periodic review as to how we are communicating that, executing it, and it being understood is quite critical. Um, so uh, I would like to uh, do a follow-up with this. Uh, Fred, I'm going to contact you and maybe we can think about how we put together a, a look at this just to have that. Um, and who and and then send something out uh i can send something out to invite participation in that uh maybe facilitated discussion jacob is back my apologies um i got um booted out um Sorry, yeah i, I th there's a lot to say on all of this i think the fact that um there's been so many different points of views and uh, different um sort of how do you define x y and z uh means that we probably should get together and try to figure out um, how, how to get this done. I think that, that to me is the biggest eye opener, the fact that we couldn't get a consensus in terms of how to define that. Um, so I, I guess you can imagine your average homeowner slash even investor um, who owns a rental property um, is going to be properly, uh, probably very um, confused in terms of, you know, the definition of let's say. 
Yeah, I think everyone wants to have some basis by which they can manage this. Uh, but I, you know, I think um, if I'm a parent and I'm going to rent a property, um, knowing that this is a, a neurotoxin that is being addressed by the public, there's a lot of funding going around uh, to support efforts to do that. What's what can I count on, and really count on um, to to best protect uh, my my family, um, but contractors and owners too, right? And like, what do I need to do to get to a comfortable standard? And I just think it's been about 30 years, uh, almost since we passed the initial law, and there's been an extraordinary work done by the uh, MDH and MDE on this, and property owners and others. Um, and so, and but I do think it's something to to understand. And also, um, you know, when we are saying lead safe, that's really lead safe for the housing and also communicating uh, well other sources so that we can uh, be clear on that. Um, all right, listen, uh, what do we have next here? Um, Fred, are you finished with your presentation? Yes. Okay. Um, we did have next on the agenda a uh, story map initiative um, with MDE and DHCD. Uh, Tyler got called away into a different meeting, so we're going to have to postpone this to October and then can DHCD. You, can you put the agenda up? Do you mind? Oh, yeah, yeah. Me, yep. Sorry. Let me go ahead and do that. Yeah, thank you. Agenda. Here we go. And um, so the story map initiative, which is mapping statewide efforts on housing equity and lead prevention, that'll be um, postponed until October. Um, but what we have next. Uh, can I just raise one point on that? Yep. And for those who are participating on that, uh, first of all, do we have a DHCD representative now? We do not officially have one yet. They're still in discussion with that. I just got word today. Um, so hopefully by October, we'll have a representative. I did get a name, though, of the person who would be presenting this particular um, uh, line item. So, um, yeah, okay. so we have somebody who's going to present, and then Tyler should be ready as well next month. Okay. I just want to, uh, if you could, send a message, um, please, uh, that I want to make sure that they're able to describe how the mapping that they want to do here on housing equity and lead relates to the EPA distressed communities map. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, I will send them an email and yeah, make because sure I think that has been, and I would like to, uh, <laughs> Wendy, potentially invite the Region Three Environmental Justice Coordinator. Do you uh, have a name for that? Yeah, I will get that to you. Uh, okay. I'll last name and have them be in attendance um, for the next meeting as well, and maybe to talk about their efforts on the Get the Lead Out campaign. Um, I think that would be very important to talk about the EPA efforts on that same uh, meeting. To that end, looks like we have EPA lead screening levels for soil and play areas, uh, Wes, Mandela, and Cliff. Who, do you guys want me to share the screen or do you? West Sounds like wanna... a dirty job. <laughs> so I'm not sure who's the one who's taking the lead on presenting. Sure. The commission had asked for an update um, in January of, of this year. The APA released new guidance for levels of lead and soil. Um, this guidance is focused on first Superfund and what we call RECRA sites, resource recovery sites. Um, and Fred's going to provide uh, a presentation on that update. I think the commission was interested in look at the implications for other residential properties in Maryland and, and looking at our standards. So, uh, Fred? Do you have it or do you want me to pull it up, Fred? I have it. I have it. Okay. Okay. There it is. Okay. All right. You guys see it now? Yep. We're good. All right. So um, let me straighten this out here. 
<laughs> All right. So as you guys know, uh, uh, um, CDC recommended that we um, lower the blood lead reference level. And we and MDE started sending out notifications to parents in October of uh, 2022. Um, we began doing uh, environmental investigations um, for that new threshold in January of this year. Um, so they're also looking at uh, <clears throat> funding to support uh, the premise that they're, and this is something that came up uh, just a second ago about what is the safe level of lead in the home or safe level of what is lead safe. Um, there is a slogan. Um, I don't know how uh, clear it is from our point of view, but the EPA believes that the science is clear there is no there is no known safe blood lead level in children. So that's kind of where the direction is going. Um, there, we've met with uh, EPA yesterday and they were talking about the marketing campaign to get this out. Um, there's been conversations back and forth um, on both sides, pro and con of lowering the uh, soil level. Uh, and there's a next slide here where there, uh, the new standards going from 400 parts per million to 200 parts per million in soil and then property with multiple sources going down to 100 parts per million. Um, so there's, they're, they're moving forward with this. Uh, I believe uh, there's other states that are following behind this. Maryland is definitely in, in line with this, as well as the uh, dust lead clearance levels that they've lowered uh, early this year also. So um, and here's some links to the announcements and I can share those in the chat with you guys. Um, but that's that's primarily it. Wes, I didn't have anything additional if you wanted me to add anything else. Um, but we we have gotten conversations from uh, both inspectors and health departments on either side of this and uh, inspectors and labs um, as far as having the equipment to test at these levels. If we send samples out, uh, inspectors making sure that they're uh, sending out requesting the the uh, thresholds at the appropriate level. So it is going to require a significant amount of outreach and education for the regulated communities and then um, for the public as well, um, where we can test and, and the amount of samples that we take. So, um, but, but ultimately, I think the intent is to uh, move towards, Ruth Ann, what you were mentioning too, is to make sure that homes are, are more safe. Um, um, and so that's that's what the goal is. Yep, absolutely. Any uh, questions? Very. And thank you, gentlemen. Paul. Yeah, real quick question. Again, uh, thanks, Rick. I had a question before. The EPA made a differentiation between play area soil and non-play area soil. Uh, is are they eliminating that now, or where does that stand? So I, I'm not sure. Uh, I know that they were looking at what is defined as play areas. So these are areas, essentially, you know, if if your child plays in the backyard, it could be considered a play area with the um, the the equipment or the toys. It's just similar to what is it can be described as a sandbox, but designated uh, play areas uh, as in like parks or neighborhood parks and things like that as well. Um, opposed to just a uh, 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 un unchanged landscaped area, um, things like that. So uh, I'm still getting familiar with what the what the delineation and how it's going to be defined. Um, but ultimately, I think it's going to require uh, a lot more conversation and a lot more uh, discussion from from how we're going to implement this as, as we move forward. Yeah, and Paul. You're correct. There is still a differentiation between non-play areas, uh, which has a higher level. This is reducing it specifically for play areas. Um, and as Fred mentioned, the impetus is EPA is looking at all these different sources, lead and water, lead and soil, lead and paint. And based on the new 3.5 blood lead reference level, what is more of a health-based standard? So instead of just setting the standard for clearance or hazard, they're saying based on those levels, 
would a child reach a level of 3.5 or not? And so that's the impetus for this. And as Ruthann mentioned, lowering the lead dust hazard and lead dust clearance levels. Again, the intent is to keep kids below reaching 3.5 if those are the standards. So they're really evaluating each of their standards based on that, which we call more of a health-based housing standard um, is really the impetus. And those dust standards are waiting for final rule um, to come out. They were released in 2023, but we're still waiting for that to be finalized. I don't know if Fred has any information from yesterday. Did they mention anything about timeline, Fred, at all, or for the final rule for the lead dust? Yeah, they, they're trying to get it pushed through by the end of this year. And okay. so, you know, um, we'll see. Uh, I think they're coming to town that we have a uh, a form for our accreditation department, I believe, September 24th. And we have two of the representatives from the EPA coming down. So we'll we'll talk to them some more then. And hopefully I'll have an update for you guys by the October meeting. Oh, thank you. Okay, so all right, let's go. Yep, I'm sorry. There you go. Let's go to the okay. next. We appreciate that. And uh, if, again, comments if you want to make them uh, continue to email us on this. Uh, aviation gas, uh, Paul Rogers. Uh, just a real quick question, just for information. The uh, state of California just passed a, a law that is out. Lay out um, outlawing av gas and uh it slowly goes in effect and they go over it's a couple of years till 2030. i know there was a a law introduced to in the maryland to legislature in 2022 about aviation gas i just wondered if there's any more information about what maryland is doing on av gas yo fred so we we were we tried to work with our air administration uh last year on we were seeing some some discussion about uh lead and uh aviation gas uh we did we had our epidemiologists start pulling uh data on homes that are around airports to see if there were any trends um if that conversation kind of died out but i'll uh, i'm glad this came up because I did want to reach out to our air administration to see if they have anything that kind of falls under them. Um, but I'll, I'll reach out to them, but we, we really had some conversations going pretty strong last year about this topic. And then it kind of just fell to the wayside primarily, I believe, because there were just a lot of other things going on with lead and, uh, uh, the thresholds and things like that. But I, I think that's extremely important. I did not, to be honest, I didn't follow the California, uh, legislation as much as I should have, but I know that it's on on everybody's radar. So I do need to to catch up on that. But it's something that uh, concerns us uh, simply because I, I I was not aware that there were still planes that were using leaded gas and they dump it quite frequently as they as they fly. So to, to empty fuel. So it's something that um, we need to start looking at. Um, but we haven't noticed any significant trends in, in elevated blood levels around airports in Maryland, uh, which is good, but we, we have kind of uh, been keeping an eye out for it, but I'll, I'll follow up with our air administration uh, this week to see if they have any updated information to get back to you guys. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, I think the last thing on the old and new business on the agenda is um, just a discussion for whoever wants to share any information or ask questions regarding lead prevention, lead poison prevention week, which is from, I believe, October 20th to the 26th. And well, anybody yeah, want to share you, anything? You beat me to the point there. Um, yeah, so um, I think MDH, uh, MDE, uh, uh, and I know GHHI have been talking about this. Um, Wes, do we have anybody on the phone here from GHHI standpoint on what we're doing on Lead Week to talk about that? I'm good. I can uh, speak. This is Shadia. There is Shadia. Shadia, could you please introduce yourself? Um, yes. It would be wonderful. If you Absolutely. Would Hi, everyone. My name is Shadia Musa. I am the Outreach and Education Manager here at GHHI. I started about six weeks ago. Um, so it is a pleasure to be on the team and be on this call. 
Um, so to Ruthann's point, yes, we have been meeting biweekly with MDE and then MDH to discuss plans for lead week. Um, so we have a rough draft of our plan. We plan to do a press conference um, on Monday, October 21st. Um, we want the commissioner, um, I'm sorry, we want um, the mayor to be there. We want Councilman Conway to be there because he's been doing some great work with the lead service pipeline with DPW in Baltimore City. Um, we also want the Secretary of the Environment as well as Secretary of Health to speak, um, as well as Ruth Ann. Um, we are planning to do a large scale kind of community resource fair and day after the press event and invite local schools um, to come as well. Um, and then we have some different events throughout the week, um, including events for homeowners, renters, um, families, um, and schools. So we already have a school date set as well to do some activities um, with families and children. Um, so yeah, that is our plan as of right now, um, but we are still in the works meeting bi-weekly. And if anyone has any ideas and or you know information, please feel free to, to share it or send it my way. Let me um, let me start and Shadi, good to see you. Um, but uh, one thing I hope we will do as a committee, and I hope to hear from MDE and MDH and DHCD as well here, um, we'd love to focus a little bit on um, the role of lead in all of the climate uh, work that's being done and making sure people know that critical piece of lead as a linchpin to the work that gets done on weatherization and other climate and energy related. But have we talked about uh, reaching out to all of the county commissioners uh, and getting either a statement or a proclamation uh, from the not only the city but county commissioners and and those cities uh, those uh, cities like Frederick, Annapolis, et cetera, to make sure that they're putting it on their docket, their agenda, even if it's a mention at their county commission meeting that gets into the public uh, domain. It would be great to do. Um, I, uh, Theo is on here, I think. Have, are we thinking about reaching out to the health officers in all of the counties? I know the Prince George's County Health Officer um, has been a great partner and I know would love to be involved um, uh, there. But Theo, are you still on the line? Is there um, some plan to reach out to the health officers? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Um, so I'll start by saying, you know, we've been discussing this with each of the 11 participating jurisdictions um, as part of the home visiting program. Um, for many of them, you know, as of the last month, at least it was still kind of early days. Um, uh, I believe Nancy's on, she can correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe we send out a health officer memo, um, you know, noting uh, the uh, upcoming love week. Um, but uh, Nancy, please correct me if I've got that wrong. Or Dr. Savetis, my apologies. Oh, no, you're right. They'll be done. They'll be notified. But of course, open open to other ideas if you're thinking, you know, something more robust or, or otherwise. Yeah. Shadia, do you have a thought on that? Or no, I think that's a great idea. Um, we can add that to our agenda for next meeting as well to discuss. And are we putting together a social media toolkit? Do you know? Okay, so we'll be doing that with, so we're pulling together the comms. So anybody yep. who's on the call for comms uh, officers or representatives, whether you're in the advocacy community um, or private sector or government, we'd love to have your comms team uh, join with us. Um, and Chani, could I ask you that uh, you and uh, the, government team here um, get together and maybe set up a comms call to do a briefing for communications um, folks in advance in the next few weeks of planning on. Absolutely. Yeah, I, we, we just looped in our comms team to our next planning meeting, so I will do that as well. On the, on the yeah, agenda. that would be really great. Okay. Um, and we would love to know like what AAP is doing. There's new money that has gone out on lead to child care uh, for lead and lead and water, I know, from the uh, state. Uh, so if there's a child care uh, as, you know, aspect to what we're doing or any other uh, ideas on that, uh, Shadi, if you wouldn't mind putting your email in the chat um, and then uh, MDE or MDH, do you want to say further on what uh, events? 
Paula? Yes, else? hi. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the things um, that I know were both uh, on MDH and I don't, I'm not sure about DHCD because, um, you know, leadership has kind of changed within the, the lead commission and, um, and, you know, so we are reaching out to them. I've already reached out to, you know, our powers that be in our office of communication is very well aware of, you know, what we're planning for the upcoming week. I have to say that um, Wes has been amazing. Um, I, I really do enjoy, um, you know, kind of not taking a backseat, but, uh, you know, we've expressed really great ideas. One of the focuses is going to be um, highlighting our 30 year um, law at primary prevention and then tying that into the federal bright future start lead free so we've come up with a really good slogan we were going to be doing um in the past we have done forums for contractors during lead week but we've decided that um you know these are better suited to our regulated community in the early earlier spring in case there's new laws or regulations that have been amended so we can keep them fresh and updated. Um, I'm working on the proclamation, which I'll be sharing with everybody. Um, and, um, you know, everybody will kind of have some input, input into that. Um, that's focusing on bright futures and our 30 year anniversary. So, um, anyway, um, that's it. Um, and Shadia, has there been any calls with the federal agencies over lead week? I'm not aware of that. Okay. Well, we do. Let's, uh, we, I think, um, for the, we need to do that. Paula, have you been in touch with the federal agencies? Have they put anything out? They have. We shared, I mean, generally what we do is we share their social media package and, and what the slogan is going to be. And, you know, we all know this every year, it's, you know, it's sometimes it's EPA taking the lead, sometimes it's CDC, other years it's been HUD. So, uh, you know, I've shared with everybody on our calls, the social media package and, you know, what the platform um, is going to look like. So I think, you know, things are moving ahead. The one thing we wanted to nail down was the press event. And um, so I, I, um, I think we're, we're good thus far. We're not in emergency mode yet. Yeah. Well, oh, sorry. We, I just, we, we want to be well planned. Right. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm I was sorry. saying, I just checked um, CDC and I'm not seeing anything updated for this year as of yet, but it's a good kind of basis from last year's social media package as well as just the plan for the week. Yeah. Um, I know, I know HUD's doing it, but let's um, maybe uh, see if Maryland can convene a call with its federal partners and see what we can do. Cause I think, I would love to invite Administrator Regan uh, to come and visit us during Lead Week. I know we've had the HUD secretaries a lot, um, but or or somebody from CDC. I think it'd be great. I do appreciate this. We will continue to drive. Shadi is amazing, uh, so I hope you all will give her a warm and robust welcome, along with uh, uh, Janet Richardson, who's uh, heading up our Maryland team. Um, let's go through if there's any other uh, from the groups here. Um, and I want to suggest a change, Wendy, to this agency Hot Topics Current Events um, that I'll, I'll email you a little bit, but I want to make sure that we do, uh, and I know we do open for public comment, but there's lots of good folks uh, working on these issues around lead and making sure I would like to make sure in October for the meeting that we're in, uh, we'll work with MDE to invite a lot of the advocacy groups around the state who have an interest in lead in joining the commission meeting. Uh, MDE, any other hot topics? I don't uh, have anything. Dr. Banks? Uh, nothing for me. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I do have and, one thing. We applied for the HUD grant for a technical studies grant, and the the grant itself it's it's a you know for about I'd say around two hundred eighty some thousand dollars. It's over a three year period, and basically what the grant is proposing is that we will be evaluating the use of um chapter 16 guidelines and in evaluating hazards lead-based paint hazards during environmental investigations so stay tuned for that great um next uh and it, it mdh no yeah cliff uh, had to step off I know Theo's on, though, I believe, uh, right? And Nancy's on. Wait, let's see. Yeah, I yes, think Theo, Theo. Yeah, we don't really have any updates other than Dr. Mitchell is taking a much-deserved vacation. Uh, but oh, my goodness. I don't know if you thank have anything you. else. Sorry to bother him on that. Paul, I thank you for your uh, contributions today. Anything else from M AAP? Uh, uh, no, nothing else. Thank you. And I need to sign off for another Paul, can I ask that AAP's office, if you could be in touch with them and ask them if they will participate in the lead week planning, that would be really great. Will do. Thank you. Um, MSDE. Um, nothing to report. Thank you. Okay. And again, hopefully you'll participate in the planning for lead week. Uh, insurance administration? No, nothing. Thank you. Okay. DHCD, do we have anyone on? Okay. Uh, Nicole uh, or Julie from Baltimore City. Hello, um, this is Julie Diedralmo from the Baltimore City Health Department. Um, I have been, I just joined the meeting um, earlier this week with MDH um, and MDE planning for lead week. Um, so I will be working with them on that. And then also my team is planning um, in the midst of planning for some local events as well, which I'll share once we have that um, figured out. Okay, well, great. We look forward to working with you, uh, Julie, on that. Sure. Um, any other updates from uh, Wes or uh, anyone else from GHHI, uh, Shadia, Carly, anyone? Um, yeah, I apologize, as you mentioned, Ruthann, but just wanted if you will mind that thriving communities has been released so if there are any community-based or grassroots organizations in maryland that wanted to potentially get epa funding for lead poisoning prevention initiatives or other hazard um did you want to talk about that for a moment no, go ahead please um so green healthy homes was awarded a 50 million dollar epa environmental justice thriving communities grant making program to provide 171 awards throughout region three for a very broad scope of environmental justice issues addressing all types of hazards. And so that is actually released this week. So people can go on the website and look at the application and start the application process. It's a rolling application, but there'll be 171 awards ranging from 150 to $350,000. So it's a great opportunity. It's targeted to somewhat non-traditional community-based organizations grassroots so it doesn't have to be you know all the sophisticated nonprofits. We're and we have a whole technical assistance team to help people with the application process and then once they get awarded to actually help them be successful in implementing their grants so it's it's a new unique approach by epa to provide post-award assistance and also to target um, a broad range of hazards but lead of if of course is one of those that's available um, and so we'll send out the link uh, as well to the commission, but really encourage people to look at that and take an opportunity to apply. Um, it's just a large amount of funding to support lead and other hazard reduction activities in the community, so. Um, Carly, go ahead. You yeah, wanna I'm not a, hi, I'm Carly. Um, I'm one of the environmental health educators at Green and Healthy Homes Initiative, so. Um, and this is not a GHHI specific update, but um, we had talked about in August um, some of the results from the lead testing in the public and non-public schools in the drinking water came out. So um, that was just the first draw, but 86,000 sample results came out and it revealed a lot um, that many schools, especially in um, Baltimore County, had exceeded the new standards and the old standards of 
um, the old standards of 20 parts per billion in the water and the new standards that are now in effect of five parts per billion in the drinking water. Um, just looking in Baltimore City and County, um, like about 10% of the samples um, exceeded that five parts per billion and in the county 30% um, exceeded that five parts per billion so and in the county 76% of that was from drinking water and consumption outlets not just um, non-consumption outlets so just important to um, stay in the loop on those and um, interesting to see what more comes out of that since these results came out. Fantastic thank you and uh if you could share the link on that, or we will share the link on that with um, with Wendy. Uh, anybody, any comment? Oh, yes, MDE, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, um, Wendy, do we have our water supply program on the calendar to provide updates on um, testing in schools? No, I don't think we do for the remainder of the year. Do you want me to add? I, I think we. I think we should. Do you, you want to do October or what month would, would you want me to put no, them on? I, um, I think November or December is probably fine. October is probably really busy. As, as a reminder, we're breaking on Jim December, also, so we won't have a meeting on December. Oh, Jim. Yeah, hi. Um, we would be happy to provide an update. Um, November would probably be better than, than October for us. Okay. okay. All right. Great, Tim. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Tim. That. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Carly, for raising that. Um, our next meeting is October the 3rd. Hopefully you'll get in your nominations to the uh, MDE's uh, LED awards if you have those, and we will share them uh, publicly on uh, our uh, communications channels for folks for the state. We we'll look forward to the mapping initiatives and uh, the robust updates on awareness and how we can take Awareness Week, not only uh, in October, but throughout the year. So appreciate all that are gonna work hard on making that robust in our schools, in our communities, um, and throughout the state. Uh, I did have a question there about uh, making sure we ask the governor for proclamation on this. I know uh, it's one of the elements uh, eligible in the Enough Act, uh, so I want to make sure that we hear uh, from Governor Moore. Uh, so I hope MDE uh, will take that. Um, and uh, really appreciate the discussion today. Look forward to convening a facilitated conversation on what it means pub to the public uh, to be led safe and how we can align uh, our uh, local, state, and federal statutes accordingly so that Owners can operate well, consumers can operate well, and most of all, want to welcome at, uh, our new uh, uh, commissioner, Allie, and uh, appreciate uh, your participation uh, and uh, your future participation uh, in this. And the thanks, as always, for Wendy for putting things together. Uh, thank you all. Have a great uh, month in between. Thank you.